My name is Yael Evelo. <laughs> I live in New York City, and I run a record label there called Loakabop for 27 years. Tom Zay was the first artist we signed directly. And uh, David had been in Brazil going through a record bin, and he was, you know, he knew he was going to do a Tropicalia record and a Samba record and a Vaho record. And in a Samba bin in one store, he found this record with a barbed wire on the cover. He thought, that's, that's really strange. So he bought that record and he took it back to New York. And when he was listening, he says, this, is, this, this isn't a Samba record, what is this? And he talked to Arta Lindsay, who we both knew, and, and, and Arta said, oh, Tom Zay, you should know about him. And Tom Zay was a, a, a tropicalista, part of the Tropicalia scene, but where everybody else he was friends with in the Tropicalia scene had become popular, he had kind of become forgotten. I, I mean, I heard the first time I heard it, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I never heard anything like this. And, uh, you know, I thought this is going to take over the world. This is incredible. But we resuscitated his career, really, by putting out the records. <laughs> Tim Mai was one of the largest stars in Brazil. He was like Elvis Presley in Brazil, to some extent. Not this, exactly the same era, but in terms of the scale of his fame. And he's still incredibly famous. And everybody in Brazil has a story about him because he was the most outrageous character you can imagine. He, uh, at one point, he went to, to England and he bought 200 tabs of acid. And he came back to Brazil and he went to his record label, Phillips, which he called Phipps. And he went to Phipps and he said, went to each office, starting with the most straight ones, as he said, the, the legal uh, uh, people and the, and the people who did the royalties. He said, open your mouth and stick out your tongue. I want to give you something that's going to take you to such a cool place. And he put a tab of acid in everybody's mouth. <laughs> so there was a lot of stories about Tim. This guy, uh, Uchenna Iconi, called me up one day and said, you know, you have one track from William Onyabar in your compilation of psychedelic African music. Would you like to do a whole record of his? I said, I, I would really like that. He says, great, because he lives in my town, Anugu, and uh, I'm gonna go there for Christmas. And I spend about three months, and he's told me he's agreeing, he'll agree to do a compilation. So if you give me a contract and some money, you know, we'll, I'll give that to him, and, and we can put that record together. I thought, fantastic. Uchenna goes to Nigeria in, I guess, October, and he doesn't return to the States for nine months. And he comes back, and he apparently had given Onyabar the advance money, but Onyabar hadn't signed the contract. He told him, I'll sign it tomorrow, but there would never tomorrow never came. So for four years, three years rather, just, just stayed like this, you know, and I, I would call Uchenna and say, what's happening, Uchenna? And he goes, well, he's, he's, I'm, I'm going to get the contract signed. I'm going to get it signed, but it never got signed. And eventually, Uchenna got a girlfriend of his to go to Onyabar's house and tell Onyabar, I'm not going to leave until you sign this contract. And she sat there for five hours, but eventually he did sign the contract. So I called him up. I said, Mr. Onyabar, this is so great that you've signed this contract, and I'm really looking forward to working with you and doing this record. I had hi I've hired a Nigerian novelist to talk to you about your life. He goes, why would I want to talk about that? And I go, you know, that kind of took me back. I, mean, I, I did, didn't really know. I said, uh, so that people would know more about you? And he goes, I just want to talk about Jesus. And he hangs up the phone. I didn't realize when we had done a psychedelic African compilation, and we had notes on all the other artists, and there were no notes on Onyabar, I, I just thought that, that just we couldn't find anybody who knew him. I didn't know that it was because he didn't ever want to talk about anything having to do with his musical history. One person said, you know, he's, he, he, um, he was a filmmaker who studied filmmaking in Russia. And another person said, oh, really? I heard he studied law at Oxford in England. You know, so we would hear like little bits of information that we couldn't really figure out like what was the truth. You know, I had seen Alice Coltrane play in, in a jazz club in, in Boston. And I, you know, I knew, I had her records um, and I'd heard about the cassettes. And, you know, I'd heard about it in a sense as a jazz person would, which is like, oh, then she went off in some ashram and did some quifty Indian music or something like that. You know, this was not commercial music. This was not music meant to be sold to people who didn't already know about it and, and love it. You know, it was really, she made the cassettes for the people in the ashram who would sing this music on a Sunday and have the cassettes for the rest of the week, you know, to listen to when they weren't singing together. I mean, that singing together really was her, 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 more than her gospel, it was really her, her whole uh, philosophy was in that group singing. I 
I never thought anything would be a hit. You know, this is a 12 inch, a brim full of Asha, the Norman Cook remix. And Gary Walker in England had sent Norman Cook, you know, the new, Tijin, the new corner shop record with this track. And, 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 and uh, Norman Cook goes, I really want to remix that. So Gary says, of course you can remix it. So he does a remix and when he sends it to us uh, in, in the States, uh, I gave it to the head of um, dance music for Warner Brothers, who doesn't like it. And she goes around playing the record for everybody at the company going, this is awful, isn't it? See what they did to Ginger's voice? So in, a, in the States, they didn't use the Norman Cook remix as the, the hit single. They used the tr one that was on the album, where in England, of course, it was also really huge, and they used the Norman Cook remix. You know, the way John Cook got signed is his father had four wives, and one of the wives, um, you know, and, and many children said to John Cook, if you sing for me, uh, and she liked to hear him sing Prince Nico when he was a kid, I'll give you more food. So John would always sing Prince Nico to her. And one day Prince Nico came to Sierra Leone, to Freetown, and John Cook went to see him. And, and, and he said, in the middle of his show, does anybody here want to sing with me? And it's John Cook's friends, knowing he sings, you know, sings him, Prince Nico pushed him on stage. And, and, and Janka starts singing a Prince Nico song and he just loves the response from the crowd and he goes, this is what I want to do. And the war had started in Liberia. And two um, men who had a record label in Liberia, a pop label, moved to Sierra Leone. And they put a general call out for anybody who wanted to make records. And Janka was like number 50 in line. And when he got to see them, uh, he started singing a reggae song. And they said, doesn't anybody here know anything other than reggae? So then he started to sing boo-boo music, which was the kind of music that was never really recorded. It was ceremonial music. It was music you'd played for each other. It wasn't music that would, you'd buy a record of or anybody thought that you would. And they go, that, we love that. And he started making records of boo-boo music, which people in Sierra Leone listened to, but they didn't you know, have a records of. And it became hugely popular. And he became a pretty big star in Sierra Leone.